All right, so the big question today in the EV world is of course on everybody's lips and that is all about Lucid and whether or not Lucid is fact or fiction. And you know, I've been watching a ton of content creators out there on YouTube that really kind of break this whole aspect down. And today with me, we're gonna jump into it deep with a guy by the name of Warren Redlick. And uh, my name is Paul Barron, this is Tech Path. Warren, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, I really appreciate yeah. it. This is gonna be fun. We're, we're gonna have a good time, I think, in really kind of breaking down uh, your position on Lucid. I wanna just kind of go into it first uh, from a, a standpoint of just Lucid, the company. When you look at Peter Rawlinson and some of the talent that this particular company has put together, and I think from, you know, for most investors, obviously for those who are listening or watching, you know, Lucid has recently uh, put their deal together with a SPAC, they're going, uh, obviously in a position for IPO, but they, they're, you know, the typical thing that you deal with in investing in a company is you always look, at least for me, I always look at the people. And, uh, cause you kind of have to follow that because that's usually the, you know, the derivative of the tech. What is your thought on the leadership team there at Lucid right now? I think it's top heavy. I think if you look at the investor slide deck that they released when they did the SPAC merger, Right. There's a page with 19 people wearing suits who are probably making at least $250,000 a year each. And you you know, there's this vision. I think you, you're you familiar with the startup culture in Silicon Valley and, and, sure. the, and the West Coast. And I'm familiar with the startup culture. And that's not lean. No, uh, you know, are, do not. they have good resumes? <laughs> do they do they look good in a PDF? Yes. Is that how you want to build a startup? Not, not in my world. That's not how a startup. A startup builds in a garage, not, not in a corporate boardroom. Well, and, and th that is true. And I, I would agree that some startups are in that kind of position where, you know, if you look at even Bezos when he started Amazon, it tr literally was in his garage. And you know, his whole idea and the innovation, it takes time to get to that level. Do you feel though that Lucid might be in a position where they're saying, listen, we're taking on an 800 pound white ape, uh, and that being Tesla, and it, I mean, you, when you take on an 800 pound gorilla, you really have to kind of beef up uh, to just be able to withstand the dominating force that that particular company puts on the marketplace. It's kind of like, I mean, cause Tesla isn't necessarily like a Facebook where they're buying their competition and putting them out of business so they don't innovate. So do you feel like maybe uh, Lucid's position is, hey, let's build a rockstar team and let's try to put the pedal to the metal here. Well, I don't agree with the characterization that, that Tesla is some kind of threat to a start an EV startup. There are roughly 90, would agree. 80, they're, they're like 80 or 90 billion vehicles a year that are sold globally. And Tesla sold 500,000 last year. The right. idea that EV startups compete with Tesla is misguided. And I, it's, it's a frustration of mine when I watch YouTubers and media, a new EV comes out and they compare it to the Tesla. Mm -hmm. So for example, the Mustang Mach-E, which I think is an excellent EV, should be compared to the Toyota RAV4 or the Lexus RX 350 or whatever the number is than the latest Lexus right. RX. That, if it's better than that, and uh, there's a driver named Blake Fuller who I spoke to about it, who's driving the the, uh, the Mustang Mach-E and he said it's the best Ford he's ever driven. Okay, now you've got something. If you can tell me yeah. this is a great, this is better than ICE, it doesn't matter if you're better than Tesla because Tesla can't make enough cars to displace right. all the internal combustion engine vehicles. So the idea that Tesla is a competition problem for Lucid is misguided. The The challenge, ICE is the competition. ICE is the 800 yeah. pound gorilla. The internal combustion engine industry is the 800 pound gorilla. And it's old and it's in trouble and it's getting ready to get toppled. And Tesla can't do it alone. We need right. more great EV companies to come along and help topple the internal combustion engine, clean our air, free us from fossil fuels and move us to a cleaner future. Yeah, and okay, so with that being the case, obviously everybody's kind of, uh, I, th I think most people, including myself, we're rooting for Lucid because we, we want another EV company out there that's dropping you know, magic on the earth every day and doing some amazing things. Where did you lose faith in, in Lucid? Where did that transition occur? Yeah, to be clear, I was excited about Lucid. And then they had the reveal in September and I watched it and I was massively disappointed. I, I saw marketing fluff. 
I would say they have the best PDF technology in the industry. They, they, <laughs> they, they do a great job of, of putting on a posh marketing presentation. Good marketing, yeah, good marketing. But where's the engineer, you know, where's the quality engineering? Where's the, and I think partly this is, this is Tesla's fault. This is not just Tesla's, this is Elon's fault because if you watch a SpaceX Starship presentation, if you watch Autonomy Day or Battery Day from Tesla, mm -hmm. The, the depth that they go into in the technology show, this is what we're doing, this is how we do it. I mean, Battery right. Day was astonishing. The depth that they went into, and here's what we're gonna do, here's how we're gonna do it. Autonomy Day was like three hours long, and Ard Andre Karpathy going in depth, and here's how we do vision, vision, computer vision. And then the reveal for Lucid was like, well, we have the Wunderbox. Well, yeah, what's, yeah. The wonder, what's the technology inside the Wunderbox? You know, you could yeah. give it if that's a marketing name. Oh, we have this, you know, highly dense engine, you know, motor. Well, what's the what makes it work? Give me more. And yeah. Tesla and SpaceX spoiled us on what to expect in that kind of reveal. And so that started it. It's like, no. And and they even said in the reveal, they said, we have some journalists here. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. And then there was no Q&A at the end. And they just mm -hmm. had their investor call for the SPAC merger. And they didn't have a Q and A. They specifically said we're not having a Q and A. Elon does Q and As. He takes tough questions from people, and he answers them. They haven't taken a tough question. There has not yet been a journalist ask them a hard question. Not even Ed Ludlow's Bloomberg interview after the SPAC merger was pretty good, but he did not ask good questions. He asked some good questions, but he didn't dig deep enough. So I think that's the problem with Lucid is they have not faced a hard question. There are a lot of, I would call them red flags. It's funny because people yeah. will say something about Tesla's a red flag. There are a lot of red flags with Lucid. Okay, so, all right. So the whole scenario is show us the money. We want to see the tech behind this in terms of your battery tech claiming to get to 500 miles uh, in terms of range. That is one of your you know push points there. Are you seeing any contradicting evidence that says, hey, um, Lucid is out here. If What if Lucid were to come to market with a 400-mile vehicle? Well, I mean, they claim they're going to have a 500-mile vehicle. I know, I just, but it, I just that's had hard an interview. to do. I, <laughs> so I just had a conversation last night with uh, another YouTuber named 2 -Bit Da Vinci, who has a great video uh -huh. recently on the, yep. on the Mustang Mach-E, actually. Yep. So yep. we agreed that if Lucid delivers 100 vehicles in 2021, and they deliver a, a vehicle with... A hundred. Okay. Well, because they, right. they've said first they said they were going to deliver six thousand. Six thousand. Yeah. This is part of the the confirmation that I'm right that Lucid is a uh, is not believable. Is not credible. Is a week before the SPAC merger, Peter Rawlinson's on Fox News, Fox News talking about delivering six thousand vehicles in 2021, and right. a week later they dropped the number to 577, and they dropped yeah. from spring deliveries to we'll deliver, we'll start, we'll do production this year. Um, that's a major miss. And I, I claim, I've, been, I've had a lot of heat from pro lucid people saying Warren's unreasonable, blah, blah, blah. And like, well, I called it. They are not going to deliver vehicles this spring. I don't believe they can. But we agreed. So th their target is 577 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And their target is right. still a 517 mile range vehicle. So I agreed. And Ricky from Tubit Da Vinci agreed that if they deliver 100 vehicles this year and they get deliver a vehicle with 450 miles of range, then that establishes some credibility and I have to give them some right. credit for that. But until they do yeah. that, I don't, I don't think they will deliver 400 miles of range. I don't think they will deliver 350 miles of range. And I don't think they will deliver any wow. vehicles in 2021. That's my, my gut. But Big I'm, statement. But you know, Ricky and I sort of compromised on those numbers. Deliver 100 vehicles, deliver 450 miles of range, EPA rated range, and then we can talk. Why? Yeah, so why do you feel that Lucid, obviously the one is, is they keep pushing the finish line down the road, but if you've got a guy like Peter Rawlinson, ex-Tesla guy, ex-Jaguar, you know, a lot of automotive experience, and then you line up the roster of all the suits. Um, I mean, there's gotta be some brains there somewhere that are putting this into a position to where they can get this company ready. And obviously with their public offering, it's gonna open up some opportunities for cash and liquid and really kind of blow, hopefully, blow up their production capability. Do you feel they just can't produce it because of what? Because their orders, they claim, their order book is full, according to Rawlinson. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, a, but, bulging, uh, a bulging order book. A bulging like order I have book. two, I have two orders right here. <laughs> okay, no, they have, they have 750 orders. 
They have 750 reservations, 7,500 reservations, 6,000 of which were for the, the model that isn't coming until 2022 and only yeah. cost $300 to put the reservation down. You can do the math. 7,500 yeah. reservations, six, $650 million potential earn, uh, mm -hmm. revenue. 6,000 of those reservations ballpark have to be for the, the cheap model that they're not going to make until 2022 if they ever make it. Mm -hmm. So you, you feel that what's okay. So I guess the point is, is what's going to hold them back from getting cars on the ground this year? They, they don't really have a car. So they, you feel like I, it's just, I, I don't it's think just they have not a car. there yet. No, I really no, no, listen, okay. listen, I have said this. I'm not going to back down from this. I believe it is. Uh, this is my opinion. It's pretty clear. I don't have factual information. I haven't been inside the company. I believe it is an elaborate fraud. It's Nicola 2.0. Oh, wow. uh, with, with, you know, more advanced, uh, Peter Rawlinson is way, Trevor Milton was an obvious clown. Peter Rawlinson is a much better poser. Um, you know, and, you know, he, they, he has a great resume. They make great PDFs. They, they put on a much better show, but plain and simple. Why, if you follow the, if you watch the Ed Ludlow interview that was right mm -hmm. after the merger, Peter Rawlinson said that Alan Mulally, the former Ford CEO, who's involved with Churchill Capital, that he yep. drove the car. He said it was great. And then he said, but let's get it right. Well, wait a minute. And this is where I think Ed Ludlow had a miss as a journalist. Yeah, what okay. do you mean by that? You said yeah. it was a great car, and then you said you need to get it right. So what wasn't right about the car when Alan Mulally drove it? And it was the first car off the production line. So, okay, let Dan Neal, the Wall Street Journal, drive it. Let Water Trend, let Car and Driver, let Road and Track, let, let a, a real automotive journalist take that car for it. Let Sandy Monroe take a look at it. Let somebody yeah. who's got real chops because the only this is one of the red flags. No one outside of Lucid has driven this car. I'm not even mm. sure. I don't even know if I believe that Alan Mulally drove the car, right? But and most people inside Lucid haven't driven the car. Interesting. I, you know, I, I don't I think this is an opinion again. I don't know how many people inside Lucid have driven the car, but I believe that only a few people have driven this car. We don't know what's under the shell. For all we know, it's a Model 3. It's a Model S skateboard with a lucid shell on top of it we just don't know that this is really you know the lucid car with the wonder box we can't know and i think if yeah. you read the motor trend article i think it was motor trend the journalist sat in the back seat they wouldn't let her plug in their phone because her phone because they were trying to show off the range and the right. drain of a cell phone was going to meaningfully impact the range of your vehicle on a you know five hour drive come on you know yeah. so <laughs> and you know jay Elon let Jay Leno drive the Cybertruck, right? The Cybertruck is nowhere near, at that point, production ready. And Elon let him drive it through a tunnel, and Elon wasn't even sure it was going to fit, right? So how did you... But that's, that's Elon. <laughs> okay, but, but Peter Rawlinson is, you know, if, okay, this is a key detail. For you to believe, or anyone to believe, that Lucid is going to produce a car with 2.5 seconds, 0 to 60, and a 517-mile range, okay? Faster than a Tesla Model S long range and 100 miles more range than a Tesla Model S long range. You have to believe that they're better than Tesla. You can't just yeah. say they're as good as Tesla. You have to believe they're better. And not only that, compared to the Porsche Taycan, which you know, people think I'm, all, I'm only for Tesla. I think the Porsche Taycan and the Mustang Mach-E are the two best EVs outside of Tesla, and I think they're great vehicles. But the Porsche on the EPA range only gets like 200, a little over 200 miles. You're telling me you delivered a car that's got two and a half times the range of arguably the best engineering automotive company outside of Tesla in the world. So right. you have to be way better than Porsche to do that. And it's not, and here's the problem. They can't release a car if it doesn't meet the specs. If they release a car exactly. and, and, and car and driver road and track drive it and they say, we only got 150 miles of range, or we only got 250 miles of range on a car they said was going to get 500 miles of range. If it only does a 3.5 second zero to 60, which I still wouldn't mind, right? If you do it, if you do a four second zero to 60, I still think that's great. If you do 400 miles of range, I still think that's great. But if you mm -hmm. promised 517 miles of range and you claim that you had an EPA certified lab test this and verified yeah. this, which by the way, where's the report? Where's the documentation behind? Right, they the did plan? have they did have Motor Trend. I think that uh, that actually no, it was an EPA said lab. It was an EPA lab. An okay, EPA's, was that uh, verified it? A lab, an e a lab that supposedly certified by the EPA, and I believe that's true. And they had a quote from the guy from the lab, but we don't know what he tested. We don't know what vehicle he tested. We did they have a 200 kilowatt hour pack in it? We don't yeah. know what they did to get yeah. past this guy's test. 
why not release the report? Why not release the documentation for that? This is these are the red flags. Why hasn't a journalist driven the car? Why you know because if these are the these are the holes in the story. Right, they could fill in very easily. They claim that sure. the first vehicle off the production line was driven by Alan Mulally and it was a great car. Good, let Dan Neal drive it. Let somebody from Motor Trend, Car and Track, Road and Driver drive it. Not Russ Mitchell from the LA Times. He's not on by. I don't trust him. That's a long conversation. But Dan Neal, <laughs> anybody from Motor Trend, Car and Track and Road and Driver, I believe those guys are the gold standard. Um, yeah. I love, well, I love and, Car, and and tra- I, car and Driver, Road and Track. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think if you if you are going to have a vehicle like that, especially in a situation where, really where it's almost prototype, um, that it should be an opportunity for some of these car and drive or some of these um, automotive analysts to where they can really get into the vehicle and, and kind of take it for a spin. If you look at all right, so let's we're in agreement. We we've you know I understand where you're going. I I of course am in the position of. I'm ho- I'm rooting for Lucid in the sense that I'm hoping that there's other EV companies that can actually, you know, make a make a dent, and be able to kind of help the cause overall. If you looked at other companies, whether it's Neo or Rivian or others like them, are there any others within the framework of of close to market that you feel like could actually start delivering at the scale that Tesla is delivering right now? Well, the scale is a really important question. I think the Mustang Mach-E is already a good vehicle. Uh, I don't know okay. if Ford right. can produce so it Ford. at scale. Ford, Ford yeah. Mustang Mach-E, Porsche Taycan, I think those are great vehicles that they, they still have work to do. If they were trying to catch up to Tesla, they got a long way to go, but they're already better than internal combustion engine vehicles, and there's already a market yeah. for them, and they could already sell them in volume if they can make them in volume. You know, can they improve them? And like, like here's my problem with the Mustang Mach-E. Because I sat in one, I watched uh, Blake Fuller drive it mm-hmm. at the Sebring International Raceway. He said yeah. it's the best Ford he's ever driven. Great. So the question is, can you make that to scale? And how much does it cost Ford per vehicle? Because if you sell it for fifty thousand and it costs you one hundred thousand yeah. to make it, and I'm telling you, it felt like a hundred thousand dollar car. The problem is that wow. it costs you to make a hundred thousand dollars to make it, and you sell it for fifty. Yeah, not a good, not a good play. You know, you lose money in every car you make it up in volume. That's not really a good strategy in the long run. Um, yeah, you've got to sure. be able to make that thing for 40000 and sell it for 50000 before it can go somewhere. The Taycan, they sell for a lot of money, right? So mm-hmm. but are, okay. I, I suspect yeah. they're losing money on every Taycan. So can you scale? Can you get the batteries? This is a huge problem for every EV maker outside of Tesla. Can you secure the battery supply? Because the three major mm-hmm. battery makers are all locked into Tesla, and they're they're expanding rapidly. On pure Tesla. volume, yeah. But yeah, Tesla, they're, sure. and they're making good margins, too. They're making good money. CATL, LG Chem, and Panasonic are. There, I think they're around twenty-five percent margins. Tesla is paying them to deliver yeah. batteries. They're they're not give they're not being stingy because Tesla makes so much margin on their end that they're happy to give them the margin, and they're just saying we will take every battery you everything, can make. Yeah, everything you can make. Well, that doesn't leave but, a lot for the other guys. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there are right now we are going to be dealing with a scalability issue, especially in battery supply. I definitely see that coming. However, there is an angle with Lucid. I want to bring it back to them for a second on the whole aspect of the luxury EV, because there are there are people that look at Lucid as being really more of the luxury EV uh, side of things, going after the Model S with Mercedes, uh, the BMW 7, the Audi A8. Uh, which is really the market. Now, if you look at that market, it's a very small market. It's only about 20,000 cars here in the United States with those big class vehicles. Um, so you, you, just that, made, you just made another one of my arguments. Ma- okay, perfect. So my point is, if so, how, that's how, that's a, how are they, how are they going to sell 90,000 of these vehicles in a market that has that has 20,000 vehicles? Sales. All right, so you got a U, U.S. market. So they have to basically rob from every class of vehicle in what is already uh, a very competitive space from the E-Class Mercedes all the way up to the S. Because that's the only way you get to the number that Lucid is claiming in terms of their total volume. No, 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 no. okay. So their numbers in this slide deck are, I think it's 2024, they're gonna sell 90,000 vehicles with an average selling price of $110,000 a vehicle. So that's not the E-Class. Yeah, that won't work. But that's yeah, the so S class. That's, that's a problem. The, that's the S class, the seven series, and the A8. And if the market for that, let's say the whole worldwide market for vehicles over a hundred thousand dollars a year is two hundred thousand vehicles a year. Yeah, yeah. I don't know so if it's that you're big. Half the market. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's three hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Okay. In order to sell ninety thousand, you would have to have more than a twenty-five percent market share. And you know, Mercedes has dealerships all over the world. Lucid yeah. has six showrooms in the United States. 
you know, they don't have a showroom anywhere else but the United States. The forecast There's, is a little off. Well, and, and, and no, and if you look at their numbers, they're saying if we could sell, and then you go to 2025, I think it is, and they've got to sell 135,000 vehicles at $100,000 average selling price. Mm -hmm. Well, right. Well, okay. And if they, if they make those numbers, they lose $10 billion over the next four years. Yeah. And cash flow. They lose $10 billion in cash, and they only have $4.5 billion in cash. They blow through their cash pile in two years. If they don't make the numbers they're claiming, they lose even more cash flow. And the question you get to is, well, when did they go positive cash flow? And it looks like, you know, especially these numbers, it's not, I don't believe it's reasonable to say you're going to sell 90,000 of these or 135,000 of these at those selling prices. You're going to be right. lucky. I don't, I don't think they're going to sell, <laughs> I don't think they're going to sell a car. You know, where I think this is going, by the way, is I don't think there's any attempt. I don't think, the, you talked about why do all this? What are they doing? They're trying to position themselves to get bought out by somebody. They're, they're, they have, I don't. I wouldn't be surprised if they have no intention of selling a single car. They are trying to position themselves. There's somebody who wants to get in on the EV to demonstrate their EV chops, and somebody can buy this company for $100 billion and say, now we're a serious EV player because we have this right. company with all this great technology that isn't real. Right? But I, I, I don't, I doubt that that's fly, I doubt that's viable. I don't know, I don't understand the corporate world that anybody would buy this pig. <laughs> I, I don't see who's buying this pig. You know, if, did you see the video? Was it yesterday where, or a couple of days ago where he's talking to some journalist, Peter Rawlinson, and he's like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're going to get, we're, uh, we're talking to some Silicon Valley, big Silicon Valley company about supplying our software. And everybody thinks they're talking about Apple. Apple, sure. Uh, you know, maybe they're talking about Facebook and the car is going to take selfies of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to post selfies of you in your fancy car. I, I, I don't know, you know, First of all, if you go back to their reveal, they were supplying the software. They had a great in-house software team that was going to deliver all this stuff. It was all going to be in-house and vertically integrated. What happened to that? Yeah. This is why they keep they, they keep confirming my suspicions that the yeah, whole so thing is keep a sham. Moving, yeah, moving the, and, the finish line for sure. And, and Let me ask clear. you this, though. Yeah, I was just going to say, to be clear, they can, I want them to prove me wrong. Lucid Motors, I want you to prove me wrong. Here's how you prove me wrong. Let a journalist drive the car. Let journalists drive the car. The car that was driven on Laguna Seca. Let a journalist drive that car. The car that Alan Mulally loaded. Let journalists drive that car. Show them the inside. Show them that it's really got the wonder box instead of it's not a Model S under the under the right. shell. You can do something to show me this is real, and it's because it's not just me, right? I have 45,000, 48,000 subscribers on YouTube. There's a bunch of people who've seen my videos. There's people who are angry about what happened with CCIV. Show us it's real. Show us. Don't when just give us another PDF. Angry with CCIV, meaning when when Rawlinson backed off the production number. There are thousands of people who bought CCIV at prices of forty, fifty, yeah. sixty dollars a share. That when the merge SPAC merger was announced, the stock fell to thirty dollars a share, and some of that fall is probably the result of walking back on the promises of yeah. spring delivery and six six thousand vehicles this year. Because you just changed the calculus of when you're going to make money. Sure. Yep. Right. Sure. You just you just massively changed the calculus. Now we're going to be we're going to lose billions of dollars for four years to come. That wasn't disclosed before. Before it was like, hey, you know, within a couple of years, we're making money. Now, all of a sudden, it's, we're not going to be making money until 2026. That's a big so, change. So let's, let, yes, it is. Let's let's go with some assumptions here that Lucid limps along. They don't get their production out, but they're they continue the market uh, kind of the marketing barrage that they put on the EV space. Uh, maybe they put a couple partnerships to, uh, together. How long? Can they last? Because there is some battery tech that looks like it could land by 23, 24. We've had a chance to get some guys on this show, even CEOs, uh, one just this week with Storedot, you know, that's claiming uh, the five minute charge and they're, they're working with the, the nano silicon product. <laughs> yes, the nano silicon product. Uh, there's some arguments out there, and this included Amphius, if you look at what Amphius is doing in there and that connection to Tesla. Um, so if let's, I'm just saying that in three years we could see battery suppliers that could handle scale and be able to supply someone like a Lucid and a Tesla at the same time and deal with the the volume of numbers that we're going to be dealing with, and we'll talk about Tesla in a minute because I know you've got a lot of thoughts on on how they get there, um, and I'm in agreement with uh, on the Tesla as aspect. But if Lucid limps along, gets some Silicon uh, Valley money, gets IPO, holds on. Can they make it out of the weather by 2024 and then become a real player? So first of all, just on the battery technology thing, there's all kinds of battery technology ideas floating out there. It's easy to have a prototype. 
Uh, it's easy to have a PDF that says you've got a battery technology. It's a heck of a lot harder to manufacture to scale. And you could look at QuantumScape. Yeah. Probably yeah. the most credible potential future battery player is QuantumScape. And yeah. they're not going to produce in quantity until something like 2027 or 2028. So the right. idea that somebody's going to come along and produce batteries in quantity in 2024 or 2025 is, to me, laughable. I don't want to say it can't mm. happen. I just think that's that's an unlikely story. Um, and and Lucid Story is not premised on that. Lucid Story is premised on we're going to deliver these vehicles and we're going to deliver the right. high-end market and then we're going to come down. And they have never premised on the, their story and we've got some new fancy battery technology coming along. Yeah. And, um, you know, I would I, – and I, this is the other thing, the five-minute charge thing. That's what I laughed at when you mentioned the five minute charge. There's this uh -huh. fantasy that people have that the problem is charge time. Charge time is not a big problem. And there's a fundamental chemistry issue. I mentioned to you before we started the limiting factor YouTube channel. He's mm -hmm. really good on this stuff. If you really get into battery technology, there are fundamental issues with battery chemistry, which I think right. this, is one of the, this is one of the, I think, misleading statements from Lucid as well. We got 900 volt architecture so we can charge faster. No. You can't charge the existing battery chemistries faster because they can only take a charge so fast before you degrade the battery chemistry. And it doesn't matter what voltage you charge at. Sure. Um, you, there's some trivial gain from charging at a higher voltage, maybe. But if you charge the battery faster than full battery in an hour for most of these batteries, you, know, you can yeah. in the middle in the middle of the of the charging cycle you can get to that fast. But at the beginning of the charge, the end of the charge, it's just a fundamental battery chemistry issue. You can't do it. You just can't do yeah. it. So, so there's all kinds of claims out there. The reality is we know what the existing battery technology is, and it's also about cost per kilowatt hour, which we sure. can get into Tesla. If you deliver some high-end fancy technology that charges really fast or stores a lot, but it costs five times as much as the batteries Tesla's using, Useless. well, then your car is going to yeah. cost too much yeah. and you won't be able to sell a car. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think, you know, as we continue to see this, I'm really amped up about what we learned uh, from Elon at, at Battery Day, just in the new tech, and, and also just in the sense of him being so open in the sense of, hey, we're only going to be able to produce so much of this and we're still going to need, you know, traditional, you know, supply chain that we've got already in place for our current production, which I think helped, you know, ease everybody's mind in terms of how battery production, which is really still my biggest question, and it also applies to Lucid, is how, because the battery world as it is, is finite. And uh, it really, in, in essence, it's a limited supply situation that everybody is dealing with. And of course, Tesla growing at the rate they're growing is, I just don't know if there's gonna be enough of them, especially if you have someone like a Lucid that's really going out there saying, hey, we need to get to 100,000 vehicles. Um, that's still a big production, and that's not even including GM and, and Ford and all the other players that are really coming into the marketplace and really building cars. If you look at what GM's doing with the Bolt, it's um, you know it's pretty amazing. So it's going to be fun to watch, uh, Warren. Definitely, I want to uh, pick your brain on this as Lucid starts to evolve. So I'm assuming that uh, CCIV is not a buy on your uh, on your stock. No, I actually, <laughs> I've been accused of shorting the stock, and that is not true. Okay. I have okay. no investment position in CCIV or Lucid. I did look at buying uh, two-year puts when it was trading oh, at $60 right. a share. I there did look go. at buying two-year puts. I am not an options trader. I only, I've only made one options play in my entire life recently. So I did look at buying puts and I didn't like the numbers. It was like, I think there's already a lot of people who bought puts. Already, yeah. Already I, I was looking it, yeah. for January 2023 puts so that it, you know my prediction is in the long run it's gonna fail. And the gain just wasn't there. There's so many people who bought puts that it's not a good buy. Yeah. And ultimately, I'm really fundamentally a buy and hold investor, and I just bought more Tesla stock when, that's, when the stock dipped.